Appreciate you being here. Glad to see you on this uh, Sunday morning and thankful that we are able to get together as we are assembled here today. The sermon title this morning is Down But Not Out. Don't know whether you're a boxing fan or not, but if you've ever watched a boxing match, you know that sometimes boxers get knocked down. Sometimes they stay down. Sometimes they get back up to fight on. And on more than one occasion, I've seen a boxer knocked down who got back up and ended up winning the fight. Let me ask you a question as we begin to think about this subject. I listed four names on the slide, and uh, I would ask you, with which one of these do you most identify? Abraham? I admire Abraham. What an example of faith. Leaving his home country, going wherever the Lord directed him, even being willing to sacrifice his son. I admire Abraham. I don't know that I identify a great deal with him because I'm not that man of faith. I'm sorry. What about Job? People who know me best will say, no, Tom, you don't identify very well with Job because he was known for his patience, the patience of Job. I tend to be impatient. I don't identify very well with Job. And Paul, my goodness, the great missionary, went through all of that persecution, faithful to the Lord, died for Jesus. I have a hard time wrapping my mind around that. How about you? But Peter, Simon Peter, I have to tell you, I identify more with him than anybody else on the list. He was a man quick to speak and often regretted it. Now, sometimes he was spot on, but not always. Kind of confident, overconfident, as a matter of fact, on one occasion. I identify with Simon Peter more than anybody else on that list. And if you're going to talk about down but not out, I don't know of anybody else better to use as an example than Simon Peter. You want to know some interesting facts about him? Most of these you already know. He was a fisherman called to be a disciple. We talk about the two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John, who made their living fishing in the Sea of Galilee and who were called to be an apostle. He didn't come from some prestigious university. He was a fisherman. And it's interesting to me that in the list of the apostles, he's always mentioned first. I don't know what's the significance of that, but it's always Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and the others. He's always in every list, the first one on the list. He was one of those closest to Jesus. Do you know that Jesus had an inner circle? Although he had 12 apostles, there were three that were very close to him, Peter, James, and John. They went with him where others did not go. They spent time with him that others did not spend with him. And he was quick to speak. We sometimes talk about his foot and mouth disease. A lot of us suffer from that. In Matthew 16, he was the one who said, Thou art the Christ. On that occasion, he was absolutely right. But as I said, not on every occasion. And I guess why I identify with him most is I think I see more humanity in Peter. He had great strengths. 
and he had great weaknesses. He could walk on water for a little bit <laughs> until he saw the waves and began to sink and cried out to the Lord. His life is highs and lows, successes and failures. Maybe that's why I identify with him most. He was a man who was down, but he wasn't out. Wonder why. What led to his fall? And by fall, I'm talking about that occasion when he denied the Lord three times. I think one of the things that contributed to that was his overconfidence. Matthew 26 records the words, Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Do you think Peter meant that? Yeah, I think he meant that. I think he believed that. Was it true? No. In a matter of hours, he would deny even knowing Jesus. Did you ever say, I'll never do that? And then you ended up doing that, whatever it was. I maintain that you don't know what you would do until the occasion presents itself. We can tell you what we would like to do and think we would do on an occasion. And we would say, with God's help, this is what I will do. But sometimes we end up doing the very thing we said we wouldn't. Peter's an example. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I want you to stand. I don't want you to be knocked down. I don't want you to experience defeat. But I don't want you to be overconfident. I want you to admit how much you need the Lord to be able to stand. I want you to realize that you need his strength to lean on, to draw from. But one of the things that contributed to Peter's fall was his overconfidence. And I think his drowsiness. <laughs> I started to put sleepiness. I don't know which to use, but you get the idea. There's a verse in Matthew 26. Jesus is in the garden. He takes with him Peter, James, and John the inner circle and he went apart to pray and he came back to the disciples and found them sleeping and he said to them what could you not watch with me one hour now to be fair it had been a long hard day for the disciples but still but still would you not have thought they would have been awake would you not have thought that they might have engaged in prayer themselves rather than drifting off to sleep? Ephesians 4.14 Therefore he says, Awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. I'm talking about spiritual drowsiness. Sometimes we just drift off. Sometimes we do that physically, even on rare occasions. I will call no names. I've seen that happen during the sermon. But sometimes we just get real drowsy spiritually. It reminds me of the story of the little boy who fell out, fell out of bed. His mother asked him, why did you fall out of bed? Which is one of those like questions that you go, duh. And he said, Mommy, I went to sleep too close to where I got in. Sometimes we go to sleep too close to where we got in. We are not awake. Our eyes are not open. Our mind is not in tune with his. And we drift off. What about lagging behind? 
I mean, following at a distance back to Matthew 26. And those who laid hold of Jesus, this is in the garden, led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled, but Peter followed him, listen, at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. Now remember, this is the fellow who said, I'll die with you, but I won't deny you. This is the fellow who said, if everybody else denies you, I won't. And here, when he needed to be close to the Lord, he's following at a distance. You know, sometimes we find ourselves not as close to the Lord as we think we ought to be and know we ought to be. We let separation, we talk about social distancing. Sometimes we really distance ourselves from Jesus. And we wonder why we don't feel like we used to feel and think like we used to think and do what we used to do because there's a distance that's developed. Jesus said in Matthew 16 to the disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And he doesn't mean follow me 100 yards behind. He means follow me, be with me. And I think just being with the wrong people, young people listen to me. You will do things that you never thought you would do because you're with the wrong people. And you will be better, stronger than you ever thought you would be if you can be with the right people. Let's go back to Matthew 26. Pick up the reading there again. And those who laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. We read that part, but now this line. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. He said, I don't want to be really far away, but I don't want to be right up there with him either because I'm not sure how this is going to go. And so he went over and sat down with the disciples. If ever there were words spoken that ought to ring in our ears, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Now, why would a verse begin like that? <laughs> Obviously, because it's easy to deceive ourselves. Evil company corrupts good habits. You tend to think like, talk like, and act like the people you hang out with. Make sure you hang out with the right people. He fell, and it was painful. His overconfidence, his drowsiness, his lagging behind, his being with the wrong people. Back to Matthew 26. And Peter sat outside in the courtyard. Remember, that's where he camped out. And a servant girl came and said, You also were with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. Now remember, this is the same guy who said hours before, I'll die with him, but I won't deny him. And now, sitting with the servants, recognized by a young girl, he says, I don't even know what you're saying. It gets worse. And again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Not know him. <laughs> Remember the fisherman called to be an apostle? Remember the one who's always mentioned first? Uh, re remember the one who's a part of the inner circle? Here we see his feet of clay. I do not know the man. And he cursed and he swore. He was down. 
But here's a good part. Here's where it gets really good. He was not out. At that point when that rooster crowed, when Jesus had said before the rooster crows to signal the morning, you'll deny me three times, and that rooster crowed, my goodness, the turnaround began. You do not have to stay down. You do not have to stay down. You want to know what the road back was? It began with repentance. You have to be big enough. You have to be man enough, woman enough to say, I blew it. Don't try to blame it on somebody else. It's always somebody else's fault. He made me this. She, I, it's because of, I did it. And I'm sorry. Peter didn't try to blame it on anybody else at all. The convictions went through him like giant waves, I'm sure. And he wept bitterly. But Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so he went out and wept bitterly. I can imagine him convulsing in tears. But it was the beginning of getting back up. It was a refusal to stay down. It was not letting a mistake, as great as that one was, define who he would be. Jesus said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. That must be important because he said it in Luke 13, 3, and he said it in Luke 13, 5, same words. Must be important. Repentance is the hardest thing in the world because we have to admit we were wrong. I'm sorry. I did it. And I'm going to do better. I'm going to turn my life around. I'm going to get back up. I'm not going to stay down. And then I think the second part is so crucial to his road to recovery. He accepted forgiveness. And let God use him. He didn't go around constantly talking about, oh, I made a mistake. Uh, I'm sure it was always on his mind, and especially every time he heard a rooster crow, I'm sure he had a flashback. But he didn't let that define him. When they needed a preacher on Pentecost, guess who got the job? Simon Peter, read Acts 2. I sometimes jokingly say that if I had been on the pulpit selection committee, I would not even have allowed him to hand out the songbooks. But God knew he was a rock. And he got the job. He preached to the first Gentiles in Acts 10 when Cornelius needed somebody to tell him about Jesus. Peter got the job. He was a leader in the early church. He's mentioned often in the book of Acts, especially early in the book of Acts, as being one of the key men in the church in Jerusalem. He wrote two New Testament books. That's no small thing. They bear his name. Read Acts 12, and you find that Herod put him in prison. And under the reign of Nero, he died for Jesus. Now, the Bible doesn't say. Tradition says that he was crucified upside down because he did not think himself worthy to be crucified like Jesus was. I can see that maybe that's true because he didn't stay down. Folks, most of us know the pain and embarrassment of being knocked down. Sometimes we look around to see if anybody's looking and hope that nobody knows and nobody sees. And sometimes our knockdown is public knowledge. Everybody knows it. We know the pain and we know the embarrassment. I messed up. I let my mouth get ahead of my mind. I did something I said I'd never do. I was caught in this 
terrible thing. It's brought shame to me. But I want you to know, you decide whether you stay down or not. That's your choice. You do not have to stay down. You can get back up. What wonderful words in 1 John 1, 9. 1 John's written to Christians. So I'm talking to Christians who may have been knocked down. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you know God will forgive you? God will extend a hand to lift you back up if you have the heart to do it. There's an interesting little book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. A lament is a sorrow. But some of the most beautiful words are found in the Lamentations. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because his comparisons fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Huh. Ought to make a song using those lyrics, shouldn't they? His mercies are new every day. I want you to know you can win. I want you to know you can get back up. We are all, we are all broken, wounded, hurt people. And God gives us fresh mercies to get back up and go on with our lives to serve him. Somebody commented on one of our sermons and said, your sermon seems so appropriate to the time. I've said before, I think the purpose of sermons is to bring together needs in scripture. I think what's going on now has sent some of us reeling. Would you agree? Events, losses, this virus thing has sent some of us reeling. You decide whether it knocks you down to stay or not. You decide whether you'll get back up and go on with the fight or not. I am thankful that God is a God of second chances. Let's pray together. Our Father, we bring our brokenness to you. We admit that we are often knocked down. Help us not to stay there and wallow in pity through your mercy and grace and our repentance to get back up to be, need, to be used by you bless this message to all who hear it in Jesus name Amen Kenny has picked out a song for us